You are listening to Action Design, your monthly insight into the field of behavioral economics and its applications to the world around us. We bring you leading practitioners from all industries to discuss cutting-edge behavioral research and how to practically apply those concepts to the development of consumer products and public policy. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Action Design Radio. I am your host, Zarak Khan. With me, as always, Eric Johnson. What is up, everyone? And we are delighted to be joined today by Aline Holsworth from the Center for Advanced Hindsight, where she's a principal, and she's also the head of behavioral science at Pattern Health. Aline, thanks for joining. Well, thanks so much uh, for the lovely introduction. It's great to talk to you as always. We are excited to have you, and I'm excited to learn a little bit more about how you function in doing two jobs at the same time. <laughs> Tell us the behavioral science behind being two places at once. Yeah, <laughs> doesn't everyone do that? <laughs> um, I like to take on more than I can possibly ever handle. Um, no, it, it's actually pretty simple. Um, so the the Center for Advanced Hindsight uh, side of things is my role at Duke, and the center has a number of ways of interfacing with um, industry and different partners and organizations. So the Pattern Health model is basically a research partnership where Duke is an investor in the company, um, and as a result, um, through that relationship, I get to work on these very cool projects, and and that sort of supports my uh, my role with Pattern Health. and uh, uh, we have all sorts of these uh, kinds of relationships uh, with sponsors where we work to help them solve their problems, uh, research partners uh, who are supported by other organizations, um, like the Common Sense Lab is a good example of this. Uh, we've had a startup lab. Um, so all sorts of ways of interfacing with industry. Um, and and sort of my favorite version of this, uh, at least for me, because I get to uh, do really cool research applying behavioral science uh, to digital health is uh, is how I do this with uh, pattern health. And if I recall correctly, pattern health started as one of those startups that was going through your like incubator. Is that right, or am I misremembering? It's actually not. Um, it it happened around the same time that I was launching the startup lab. So I think it's a very common misconception. Um, And it's a similar model as well. So the startup lab uh, invests in companies and does some training around behavioral science and then works on research projects with them. Um, But but it's very much a sort of limited scope, whereas the pattern health arrangement is a more long term, uh, larger investment. Gotcha. So maybe start with telling us a little bit about kind of what you've been up to at the center for a while. And then we can jump into maybe some of the the pattern health stuff. Cool, sure. Um, So the very short version is uh, I've done a lot of work in uh, digital health, um, particularly looking at uh, helping people um, do better at the health behaviors that they're uh, that they're interested in uh, improving on. So things like diet and exercise, and and really helping people uh, succeed at these goals. And you know, medication taking is another big one. Those are sort of the big three: is medication, diet, and exercise. And if we could just solve those three problems, we've sort of fixed the world. Um, <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds easy. Yeah, <laughs> like, why don't we just do that? Why, why is nobody doing that? Jeez. Uh, <laughs> I'm trying, I'm telling you. <laughs> uh, and so at the center, uh, I started just doing a lot of research, uh, uh, lots of field research, and much of it in the health domain, um, getting people to try and take smaller portions of their uh, chow mein or uh, fried rice. Uh, I got to peddle sex toys as a, as a brief stint. Um, I ha- had to figure out how to get electronic pill bottles to work. These were the glow claps that you that you read about. They sort of ding when it's time to take your medication. Um, and uh, really, that experience sort of solidified this value of celebrating what you've done and the methods and the process and not so much the results. Um, because so much of the time, we would not only not get published, but 
not even find what we hypothesized in the first place. It was, you know, or, or something else didn't work out as planned or uh, so many failures to get to very uh, few successes. And I think that is an important lesson for anyone who's getting started in behavioral science. That's sort of like what I try to leave people with who, who see these glamorous results and they read the books and they you know, watch the movies and they say, I want to be a behavioral scientist. I think it's important to uh, just put that in perspective a little bit and, and understand like, yeah, that's the 1% of studies that really go perfectly. <laughs> it's not the 99% that don't. Um, yeah, it's funny, I guess in that sense, I mean, it kind of like just mirrors science in general, right? Um, I mean, most people don't hear about the the things that don't work. Uh, so I'm, I'm interested, like, were you, um, it sounds like you started kind of like with the data truck. That was, was that more like kind of public, public health focused or was it kind of anything? And then you sort of developed an interest in health and healthcare or were you kind of always interested in that and you were looking for like an opportunity to, to um, to kind of make that more the focus of your career? I would say that at that point, at least, I was purely interested in research and decision making and, you know, social science, psychology. It, there was the, the health aspect of things really sort of emerged later when I looked back at the kinds of projects that I ha- had sort of organically gravitated towards. And I was like, oh, those are all, those all seem to be health related. Um, yeah, so I've done uh, this digital health research. I've also sort of dabbled in all sorts of non-research projects and and uh, also on the business side of things. My training is in psychology and business. So I try to use these uh, this combination of skills or knowledge or whatever you want to call it um, to really do behavioral science in a way that I think is really useful. Um, it allows me to focus on impact uh, more than... Uh, theory or, or advancing um, sort of the general literature, uh, uh, which I think is very important, but just not as motivating uh, or interesting to me as being able to reach people and work on uh, the kinds of problems that really matter to, you know, people like you and me. Yeah, so it's interesting that, you know, on the one hand, you can sort of boil it down to three big problems and sort of say like, <laughs> There's like a level of simplicity there that's like tantalizing, and then it's very much out of reach at the same time. Um, how how have you sort of seen places go about trying to address those things? You know, are there like obvious gaps that you see, and then is there are there tactics and things that you've tried to kind of put in place via your work with Pattern Health to to address that? Yeah, there are there are some very big obvious gaps and uh, sometimes I just feel like banging my head against the wall <laughs> when I see them, uh, them the same mistakes happening over and over and th- the biggest mistake which of course you're very familiar with is this idea of uh, an information based approach and just uh, like well just tell people here's a diet you can stick to um, just do this and then assuming that by giving them this information, that's enough for them to change their behavior, that they will find the motivation on their own. And so a, a lot of what we're trying to do at Pattern Health, and, and of course also with the Center for Advanced Hindsight, is uh, design environments, um, you know, as much as you can design an environment through an app. Um, so we could talk about, you know, how do you change your cafeteria or how do you design physical communities? Um, that's sort of outside the scope of a digital health platform, at least, Today it is, um, but certainly we can look at different kinds of interventions that go beyond delivering information and use some of the behavioral science tools um, that we have sort of developed uh, over time and uh, put to use, and then also tested within the platform. So um, this is a little bit kind of more philosophical, I guess. But when when you decided on like this sort of digital approach, like. What has that led to that? When you look at that, like, what do you see as the sort of, uh, like, addressable market, basically? Like, how much of that do you think uh, of people's behavior can you influence from, like, with a digital intervention, as opposed to some of the other things that you mentioned of, like, you know, physical space or, like, other parts of sort of, like, the physical environment 
um, or or like in person social environment that people are in. Yeah, I think uh, I think the reach is actually huge, um, partially because our devices are such a an embedded uh, part of our lives. And if you look at, I'd have to check the Pew statistics or or you know a Gallup poll or something. But I, the penetration of smartphones is just incredible. It's something like. Uh, well, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'm not gonna make up statistics on the <laughs> on the air, but um, it, it's uh, vastly um, beyond the majority, and it's only increasing. And I think that uh, uh, there are, of course, concerns that we have to think about in terms of reaching populations that don't have smartphones. Um, and we're actually working towards uh, towards doing that with some uh, other text based, as an SMS based interventions paired with. Uh, other methods of of delivering um, outside of a smartphone, but um, even just digital versus uh, non digital, I think there are some uh, incredible benefits to to a digital intervention. Um, simply because if you design in a physical environment, that person is not going to always be in that environment, but they probably always do at least from the trends that we see and how people are uh, engaging with their smartphones they have their smartphone with them all the time so if you can uh, design uh, notifications to be sent uh, at the right time in the right place um, you know based on geolocation and triggers uh, off of uh, you know hey you uh, spent thirty dollars in this restaurant uh, just the other day are you sure you want to uh, eat lunch here again today and and also sort of combining the financial decision making uh, aspect of things I think that that there's huge potential in this digital world that uh, that we actually don't get with the physical world so it's interesting like the examples that uh, that you just gave they remind me of a conversation that we had about sort of like big H healthcare versus little H healthcare in that, you know, the type of uh, interventions of like providing somebody with information like, hey, smoking's bad, you should quit smoking mm-hmm. versus, um, you know, the, the types of interventions that you're talking about of like changing, um, you know, like a, a, a timely prompt or making some message more salient at the right time, something like that. What are the, what are the, like the distinctions that you see between you know, the work that you're doing and some of your colleagues are doing and sort of, I guess what we would say, like little age healthcare, maybe like a more kind of nimble healthcare as opposed to sort of this bigger healthcare industry or bigger healthcare groups of like large hospital groups or something like that. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with the the focus on the patient being um, more in hospital or in clinic Uh, versus out of hospital or out of clinic, um, outside of the appointment. I think with the healthcare systems and uh, even academic medical centers, you see a a lot of focus going into the patient's visit um, when, you know, how is their uh, journey from uh, making the appointment uh, to getting a diagnosis, picking up their prescription, and then it kind of ends there. It drops off and and they say, okay, this is now the you know, patient's territory. Whereas I think that with little H, um, and and uh, and by that I mean the types of uh, companies like Pattern Health that are working with these academic medical uh, institutions and uh, healthcare systems, payers, providers, um, all of the people who are delivering healthcare. Um, uh, these are the the kinds of companies that can come in and say, okay, like let's let's actually uh, think about this last mile and uh, help the patient get from their care plan and their basic list of all the things that they need to do, which it can often be quite overwhelming. It can be, a, you know, 15 things to do every day and six different medications to take all with different directions and, and some you can't take together. And, and so uh, being able to um, just help the patient with uh, all of these uh, sort of after visit sort of situations I think is has sort of emerged as little age territory if that makes sense yeah that's <laughs> yeah, great. that makes sense like I want to dive in that like relationship a little bit more is it just um is the are the incentives different between you know obviously they kind of focus on different areas 
it's not that there's just different incentives for what you know what we call the big age healthcare has to focus on where they're not going to tackle those problems um or is it just easier or is there better opportunity in like the smaller companies in the space where i guess like what drives that difference the most is it a matter of incentives between companies or just what they're kind of able to do able to focus on um given their constraints or something like that yeah Oh man, I think it's all of these things. Um, certainly, certainly incentives are. Uh, you would think they might actually be the same. What it, what incentives do uh, little H um, companies have that big H don't? Um, they certainly have less sunk cost in terms of you know spending millions upon millions of dollars and uh, implementing an EHR and then looking you know, we, we have the benefit of not looking back and saying, well, we tried digital and it didn't really work out. Whereas you see the large institutions, um, with a little bit of that mentality. Um, and certainly there's, um, you know, you can look at the, the financial incentives in terms of, um, what are they actually getting reimbursed for? Well, insurance, um, it, until we really move to a value-based care system where um, providers are incentivized uh, for the outcomes of their patients, um, it's really going to be be tough to um, get them to. And, and I don't want to say that they don't care about their patients' outcomes, but behavior change is hard. Providers are not experts at uh, behavioral science, and. And I think that uh, without these incentives being aligned, it, it's just extra work on top of all of the work that they already have to do. And that's sort of the an amount of friction that is uh, unsurm- unsurmountable for uh, the kinds of people who are already the busiest people in the world. Uh, really, there's nothing more fundamental to health than behavior. Um, and so what we do as behavioral scientists is we study behavior, we try and help people make better behavior decisions. Um, and, uh, you know, as humans, we're directly responsible for half of our health conditions. And most of these are come from eating poorly and not being active, smoking, and not taking medications, and, and just like not following the doctor's orders. And all of these are things that sort of fall under the bucket of healthcare. Um, of course, health behavior is hard. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, given that most of our Chronic health conditions have these time delays and trade-offs, and there's all sorts of things that work against people's intentions to act into their, long, uh, their long-term interests. Um, even when they say that their health is a priority, uh, despite um, all of these difficulties, uh, health systems have really sort of um, neglected the the role of the individual and uh, and largely. Um, I don't know, j- largely sort of left it to people to figure out how to motivate themselves. Um, and, and I think that one thing that we forget as behavioral scientists is that the providers and payers who are delivering healthcare are not experts in behavioral science. Um, and they almost never have a behavioral scientist on staff. Most of the, um, you know, sort of efforts towards incorporating behavioral science or, or even like understanding um, like how behavioral science can be uh, done in healthcare is coming from not uh, big age healthcare, but these startups and entrepreneurs um, and uh, medical experts tend to be experts in medicine and not necessarily not necessarily in behavior. And so a lot of the types of interventions that we see in healthcare are these information-based approaches, these like, you know, I'm going to send my patient home with a pamphlet and uh, hope that they figure out all the things that they need to do. Or maybe even I tell them all the things that they need to do and uh, they'll figure out how to, how to, you know, follow through. And I think this is, this is not just uh, not enough to, to focus on this patient engagement and, and uh, leaving it to the patients, but I think it's irresponsible. Um, I think when we're shifting the burden of caring for patients too far onto the patient, that's just like healthcare is not doing its job and, uh, and needs to do better. (laughs) So I guess that's what I think is the big opportunity for 
behavioral science, and in particular, this integration between behavioral science and technology to really sort of fill this gap. Uh, so dive into that concept a little more. I think um, you know that makes sense into maybe the way different companies operate and like why they may try different things. Um, but something I think you know we had touched on before was that sort of with those different incentives, different structures, and these kind of smaller companies trying different things. Um, that the way that might work is those smaller companies are kind of more the testing ground, the experimental ground for a lot of these kind of initiatives, especially maybe in this behavioral space. And then eventually they can kind of work their way up into the bigger system once they've been sort of proven in those areas. You can kind of like touch on that a little bit more and how you see that working within that industry um, and what that might mean going forward for you know behavioral science and working its way into the broader industry going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And and I think that uh, what you're saying is uh, exactly right on the point. Um, the, <laughs> the, the state of uh, these large healthcare systems is that they are so complex and uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, inefficiencies in them. Um, and uh, a, a lot of that is uh, sort of as a protection against uh, against risk. So there's a lot of risk aversion in these health systems, um, partially because of the regulatory environment that they're in. Um, and and so this is by necessity. And so because of that, they're, uh, they're really unwilling to do their own large scale testing. Um, and, and you see some sort of quality improvement trials going on uh, at the healthcare level. Um, but you see very few of these initiatives uh, so far making their way into clinical practice. Um, and I think that uh, that there is a great opportunity to really show the impact um, in a smaller level, um, it's sort of like what we're doing with Pattern Health, um, but also uh, not in a way that's removed from the health system. We're still working with the same providers that are uh, in Big H healthcare. Um, it's just that they they're uh, testing their ideas on a smaller scale, and then once they've been validated, then they can scale. Uh, certainly, in theory, and hopefully, uh, ultimately, in practice, um, across the board. What's interesting to me um, about what you what you just said is that um, that they want something that's proven when you know a lot of what they do is. Um, I mean, like, I, I think uh, randomized control trials in general, like, kind of came out of um, healthcare, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it's interesting to hear that they, um, you know, that, that is applied in, in one sense, but but not in another, um, at least not in, like, the behavioral area, I guess is what so, you're saying? Yeah, so there's, there's actually lots of innovation in medicine, in, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals uh, in, in medical devices. Um, so that is where the, the health system has got it down. Where there's not so much innovation is in the patient experience, in the service design and workflow, behavior design, all the things that we sort of worry about. Those uh, to date have sort of felt tangential or a nice to have to the healthcare system. And I think this is starting to change. Um, and it's starting to change. You can see in hospitals starting to prioritize their uh, sort of satisfaction, patient satisfaction scores, or uh, or starting to talk about patient engagement. So they're starting to shift in terms of what they care about, but they still haven't really figured out how. Uh, you know, this is all of this is very soft science to hospitals. They they have not figured out how to translate the RCT methods that they're so used to with their placebo controlled trials of testing medication A to medication B to placebo. How that actually translates to human behavior, and I think part of that goes back to what I was saying about you know they're just they don't have experience in behavioral science. And this feels like such a foreign world to them that uh, that, that I think for some hasn't even occurred to them that they could do it in a uh, sort of systematic way. Yeah, I think it's so, interesting. I mean, I could really open up a massive, this would be a whole episode, just this sort of, <laughs> kind of conversation. But um, I think it speaks to a couple like aspects of psychology and that I definitely... It seems like healthcare, big or healthcare organizations are looking at that 
patient experience maybe are a little more of extreme end to maybe that experiment aversion or whatever you have you. But that's something I see pretty much everywhere. Like people are very averse to running experiments. They always want to know what other research is out there, who else has studied it. And they just want to know yeah. information to back up whatever decision they make. They don't want any information demonstrating the effectiveness of that decision. Um, and in a lot of ways they don't need it and it doesn't even help them have that. So that's something I see a lot in general. Um, but it's interesting to compare, like to your point, like, yeah, obviously the pers- like medicine is something that is, um, like everything has to go through some, through some sort of like RCT to get through, but it's interesting to think about maybe the attitude of that. And that for one, it's obviously required to do that. Like that's kind of like a law <laughs> that they have to test mm-hmm. those things, but there's also something where like you wouldn't really in, we, we think of things in these different ways where you wouldn't take a pill without knowing how it had been, you know, rigorously tested with other people, um, but we also are willing to put patients who are sick in all these physical experiences without thinking, oh, we should test these too. You know, like there's less clear, um, you know, maybe some of us that there's just a lot less clear of outcomes or effects to those things that make it feel less urgent to consider those kind of things. Yeah. And I think that, uh, because beha- there's, there's a, a feature of behavioral science that really works against us, which is that it feels like, uh, and this is actually part of what we know from studies in behavioral science, uh, that our actions and our, uh, the things in our world that are human feel very familiar and make sense. We come up with cohesive uh, stories about why we do things. And, and so we have uh, no trouble sort of introspecting and making up an explanation about why, uh, you know, A led to B or, you know, what is things that we feel we should be, uh, ex- we should feel like we should be experts in our own behavior and therefore we're experts in other people's behavior without any training. That we don't really make those same assumptions about uh, flying a plane or <laughs> like, you know, going into surgery, but for some reason we we have such comfort um, with ourselves in our own bodies, just, you know, understanding that, well, you know, like I am myself every day and I have experienced this behavior just like I've experienced this other behavior. Um, and, and so I think that's part of why people have this overconfidence when it comes to explaining human behavior. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, I know we're kind of focused on the healthcare space specifically, and healthcare feel very unique in a lot of ways, and that there are a lot of aspects of the industry that are unique to itself. But I do think that's also common in a lot of industries, and in that I think the bigger kind of incumbents tend to be less experimental and more in preservation mode, if you will. And a lot of innovation generally comes from, you know, startups or newer entries and entrants in the field or the industry that sort of have nothing to lose or need a different way to differentiate. Um, So I think like, even though we're kind of focused on that one industry, to me, from what I've seen and work, I think that's actually kind of common and that like a lot of new innovation best practices emerge from new companies and things like that. Um, And that's just kind of how these sort of things work. So maybe healthcare is not as unique as maybe it seems on its face in that way. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's something that is that is sort of a, a unique culture to uh, uh, to the startup world and to entrepreneurship that really um, encourages pushing those boundaries and trying something different. Whereas once you're uh, in a you know massive corporation, regardless of what industry you're in, it's really difficult to make big changes, um, partially because of the you know the infrastructure that you've built um but you know uh, uh, back to those ideas of risk as well and the incentives um it it starts becoming very expensive to make changes whereas when you're a nimble um you know small company a, a little age company you can really um try different things without uh causing a huge disruption across the organization yeah it's also a lot I'm more curious. expensive to make mistakes the bigger you are <laughs> yeah <say>. exactly <laughs> Go ahead, Zrock. Zrock's kind of a yeah. resident innovation person, so he might have some interesting thoughts on this. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, um, yeah, we, so we, I mean, we think a lot about, like, what enables innovation at, like, smaller play. I mean, and this is kind of true across all kinds. If you ever do, like, corporate innovation, um, 
it's always like, how do we operate like a startup? We want to be like a startup. It's like, well, they have lots of lots of things that enable that, that you are, like, from this side of things, like the corporate side of things look like benefits. But there are also um, very, like, there are a lot of risks associated with that too, right? So part of why you try things and you're testing things all the time is because, you know, you don't necessarily have, like, a stable client base or, like, user base yet. And so you know, when you have, like, a bigger, like, organization that you're running or bigger group of people that you're sort of, like, responsible to, then you start thinking more about, like, not upsetting the Apple cart as opposed to, like, oh, how do I, like, kind of, like, start capturing and grabbing more and more and more. So I think it's, like, a difference in mindset. But then it's also, I think, you know, folks that, you know, are founders or that are working at startups sometimes look a little bit enviously at, you know, the the structural advantages that, you know, a corporation has of just, like, oh, you're massive and you've got tons of money and you don't have to worry about like going out of business next month um in, <laughs> you know in most cases um that sounds nice <laughs> so so yeah i mean there, there are like huge huge differences there that it really it almost kind of depends on the lens with which you're looking um at it if you view those things as you know challenges or risks or benefits or advantages or you can kind of see it almost both ways and it's really really hard to combine them so like, like a lot of corporate innovation um, efforts are sort of like how do we create a startup environment or a startup feel or culture within uh, a big organization and it's it's obviously very challenging to do for the structural reasons you mentioned right and sadly i think a lot of those efforts become silent I load where uh, it becomes yeah. okay. This is our this is going to be our innovation bucket. But then the yeah. the innovation bucket maybe runs some tests or designs some prototypes or or you know it creates their own arm of something or maybe even their own product. But then those products never actually get integrated across yeah. the company, and that's the I think that's the uh, like uh, tragic end of a lot of innovation uh, <laughs> efforts. Right. Well, I mean, like at a startup, right, it's, it's hard to be siloed when there's only six people that work there. Um, exactly. I'm, I'm you just curious. yell across the room. <laughs> right? yeah. Get out of your silo. <laughs> um, <laughs> Eric, you're being like really siloed right now. Um, <laughs> I tend to get into silo mode very easily, so <laughs> I need nudges to I'm get out of there. I'm kind of curious. I, and I, I just sort of thought of this as we were talking about um, the, the big age, little age difference. Um, what do you call, you know, at, at pattern, what do you call people that you are, you know, helping do you, or, or serving? Do you call them users or patients or consumers mm-hmm. or what? So it depends which user we're talking about, right? Because we have the initial customer, which is the um, healthcare institution, the provider, the payer, uh, whoever is going to be the author of the pattern, which is the digital care plan. And so that is basically the first user. That's the person who's um, the subject matter expert who's setting up uh, one of these digital care plans, which they will then prescribe to another person who could be a patient, but isn't necessarily a patient. Um, and I also, I should probably move away from the word prescribe because, uh, you know, these are all, we also have use cases where, uh, you know, it's a corporate setting and it's a more of a wellness pattern than a medical pattern. And uh, maybe a, some large company uh, wants to, uh, through its HR department, uh, create this pattern of uh, happiness improving challenges and uh, then give that to their employees. Um, but in terms of what we call them, <laughs> I'm not sure if we have a uniform term because it, it really does vary. I think if we're working with a with a healthcare institution, often it will be um, the patient and the provider. Um, but even then, you know, our cust- the the provider is usually the customer. This is a, a client relationship. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I, I, the reason I asked is just, you know, in a, a hospital, it's pretty, I mean, my assumption would be it's pretty clear that there are like healthcare providers there and then there are patients and like I don't know how many people in a hospital would think of somebody that that is coming there for help as like a user Mm -hmm. or a consumer (laughs) you know Um, so it just you know I was curious if like 
how, how you all think about it, but since you're sort of in that space, um, and, you know, if you think that that sort of changes the way that you think about, you know, how you approach that relationship, right? I definitely use the term user quite frequently, and I think that it could just be a byproduct of this being a tech company, and that's a popular term in tech. The user wants to do blah blah in the language, but... I actually, I do see some signs of uh, of healthcare moving more in the direction of thinking uh, thinking of patients as consumers. Not a certainly not to the extent uh, that you see in you know actual uh, in tech companies and uh, you know like Silicon Valley uh, and so on. But um, there are some little signs that the that the the patient's experience is becoming more important, even if not in a if not conceptualized in a very sophisticated way. Certainly, yeah. uh, there's some attention to service design and how long does the you know does the patient consumer have to wait in line before they're seen by the doctor? Those sorts of things are are cropping up as uh, there's more attention being paid to that. Yeah, I guess I, you know, as I think about it, I, I was trying to think of like, okay, what are the differences between these two and like, beyond just sort of like the structural differences, or maybe I guess you could consider these t- t- to some extent structural, but like the differences between a startup like like yours and uh, a health system beyond just sort of scale, right? Um, and so mm-hmm. I was thinking at one could be like how you view the people that are using your service, your services. Um, and then the, the other is like there, there is probably a difference I, w- I would think in this element of choice, right? Like if I, I am injured and I'm going to, you know, an emergency room, I probably am not really thinking that much of like, well, do I want this one or do I want that? I mean, maybe to some extent of like which one's closer or which one could I get seen faster at? Maybe. Um, as opposed to, you know, do I want to download an app and mm-hmm. try to like lose weight or, or do something, you know, uh, exercise more <laughs> well you, yeah and i think you? i think that sort of different in the competitive environment the landscape as well is another one of those differences that contributes to the um uh, sort of lackadaisical approach of big age healthcare towards making really significant changes because they know when people are sick and or when they are hurt they will come to us, whereas there's much more uh, competition uh, among, you know, digital, uh, you know, <laughs> digital products uh, that someone can download. Um, and uh, yeah, exactly. So maybe we could think a little bit more like within the space and think of innovation, like what are some of the, the behavioral challenges that are kind of, I know you touched on some earlier and thinking like there's maybe less focus on outcome or prevention and things like that. Like, you know, what are some of the bigger sort of behavioral challenges in the space? And as much as you can share, which ones are you think trying to tackle from that behavioral angle? Um, and, you know, where's that kind of going? Um, think about like in a space like this, how is behavioral science already impacting it and how can it or should it going forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think maybe a good way to, uh, start to approach this question is to just kind of give you the landscape of how uh, how I work within pattern health and and how I uh, approach the head of behavioral science role and and sort of and then get into more details about the the types of projects uh, that I work on. So I yeah, think uh, a lot of what I do could kind of fall under the category of product design or behavioral product design. Um, and I work on these types of problems on uh, really two levels. Um, first on the platform level. So the um, the digital health platform across the board, uh, basically applied to all the patterns, uh, asking questions like, what should we do to help users set goals and stick to them? Um, not just as a you know one time and then forget it, but how can we basically dive into the research and say you know what could for example mental contrasting and implementation intentions uh, contribute to a goal setting process and then also maintenance and then uh, 
tracking of progress over time and then how do we uh, like bring in personalization of uh, reminders and and really like help people uh, keep them on track but but in a across the the board sort of way. Um, and so that's on the platform level, but then I also work on a pattern level. And this is, um, the patterns are these uh, digital care plans. Um, this is sort of a co-creation process with um, subject matter experts who are the authors of the pattern. Um, so we, uh, as we're designing this intervention, it's uh, every pattern is essentially an intervention. We want, um, you know, we collectively want uh, the patient or user, <laughs> the patient user, maybe that'll be the new, <laughs> the new term, to, to come to some sort of ultimate outcome, uh, an ideal outcome that uh, where we try to impact their behavior that, uh, that sort of gets to that outcome. And so we agree together what is the, you know, priority that what's the most uh, important behavior uh, and then we designed the plan to optimize for that so you uh, in the case of a cardiac rehab clinic for example um, they might want to make sure that their patients get the right amount of exercise and take their medications so we would design the plan to uh, focus on these particular tasks and then we would say okay out of our uh, library of behavioral interventions, which of these do you want to offer? And uh, so we're, we're sort of over time growing this library and figuring out uh, what works. Um, and, and so there's a, a lot of experiments around these different tools, but also what do people like? <laughs> and that that is sort of one of the underappreciated aspects, I think, in behavioral science, at least, where we can look at what, uh, we're very good at looking at what works and figuring out, uh, you know, when we're paying people as participants, this is what happens. But then um, we also have to, uh, in the real world, uh, I'm finding more and more, uh, make sure we design interventions that people are also attracted to. So we might have uh, a very strong intervention that is really effective, but everyone, people are really turned off by the idea because, you know, it, it feels too paternalistic or um, it comes off as taking away their control. And, and so it's really uh, some of what I do is just figuring out what is this delicate balance between the, the liking or acceptability of an intervention and the effectiveness of an intervention. So you could say like those informational campaigns are very on this spectrum between uh, acceptability and um, effectiveness. They're very high on acceptability. Everyone wants to give an informational campaign. And we do end up doing a lot of that uh, as well, in, just in terms of content delivery and, you know, Part of it is useful just to to keep users, patient users, engaged, <laughs> but it's pretty low on the effectiveness. So I think one of the challenges that I am starting to face now is uh, is a persuasion problem of trying to encourage these subject matter experts to be a little more adventurous in the types of behavioral adventure, uh, inter adventures, <laughs> these <laughs> behavioral adventures, uh, no, these behavioral interventions that they, uh, that they want to um, offer and, uh, and really do more testing around that. So you kind of give them a preset, you kind of got these like plans that you've sort of put together that are almost like templates is that right? Yeah. So it's, the platform is modular. So you can say, uh, I want to add a medication module. I would like to add a, an exercise module, uh, an uh, atrial fibrillation module, uh, you know, heart rate monitor, weight tracking, like whatever the tasks are that are medically important. And then yeah. we can add these sort of the, these behavioral interventions on top yeah. of that. And they're doing that. They're sort of quote unquote, prescribing those at an individual level for one person? Exactly. Yep. Okay. So what's the sort of scale that you need to achieve to understand if your interventions are working? <laughs> That's a great question. Uh, it depends a lot on what we're testing. So, uh, for example, if we're doing something that is based on 
you know, the the ultimate outcome variable is going to be something like rehospitalization, then we need a ton of people. But if it's something like uh, engagement in the app, which is sort of a proximal outcome, uh, then we can we can say like, okay, let's do this uh, a much smaller intervention with many more time points and say, okay, over this, you know, the two week period after someone downloads the app, if we send notifications with this type of messaging compared to this other type of messaging, are people more likely to stay on board? Are they more likely to do certain tasks? Um, so the, number of people that we need for these multiple touch points uh, is much smaller uh, because we're measuring something uh, that's also much smaller. So how do you strike a balance between the the experiments and tests that you're running that take maybe like 24 hours, Mm -hmm. 72 hours, and the types of experiments that it sounds like would take years? Yeah. And Um, we do, we do have projects that are, uh, that are taking years. Um, how, that, how do you decide sort of which ones to pursue and what the right balance is to strike there? <laughs> Funding. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. That's a good Pretty answer. Much. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, I, I don't think anyone... Uh, it would be crazy to uh, to self-fund a, a large clinical trial that spanned, uh, you know, three to five years. So those, those are the kinds of projects that we have... Uh, uh, a lot of external support for and other, they're collaborative projects that we're working on with other institutions, uh, other hospitals that have sort of um, hired us to come on board. And uh, and this is actually a situation where the collaboration between the Center for Advanced Hindsight and Pattern Health is really handy because then through the Center for Advanced Hindsight, we can say, we have the expertise to design this study and we have the academic credibility. And then from the pattern health side of things, we have the technical expertise. Uh, We know, not me, but uh, the engineers at pattern health are incredibly talented and uh, the designers make a beautiful product. And that sort of mix, uh, that combination is, I think the sort of um, the secret sauce to uh, getting these projects off the ground and actually doing them very well. And I have quite a bit of experience doing um, just the academic side where I try and, uh, you know, make make an intervention uh, myself or, you know, outsourcing uh, somewhat, but uh, it's very tricky to um, try and pull all of the parts together without uh, working with people who really know what they're doing from the technical side. So how many of your um, experiments that you run, like, do you kind of consider to be low-hanging fruit in that, like, you look at the healthcare system and you're like, okay, if I just, like, remind people about <laughs> something, they're probably more likely to do it, and that's maybe, like, maybe it would be considered a low-hanging fruit thing, versus these sort of, like, pie in the sky, like, man, this would be crazy if it worked and we're, but we're just like not sure how likely it is, but we have like, you know, obviously reason to think that it could, but you know, what's the, what, what are the kind of trade-offs that you make there? It's a a slightly different question than the, you know, three to five year versus 24 hours thing, but kind of the same thing. Yeah. I think the responsible answer to this question is that we do uh, lots of low hanging fruit and very few uh, aspirational projects for me, the reality is a little different from that. Um, and that's partially just because of my personality. I tend to get very bored of the the obvious and think that there are lots of other people who can do that. And so I, uh, I get a lot more excited about um, interesting problems or trying very different things that have some, uh, you know, ha- have a solid grounding in what we know from previous research, but are different in a, uh, in a, in some significant way. That's really more than just a translation of previous findings. Um, so I'm, I'm going to not answer the question and not put a number. <laughs> I'm not going to put a, pro- a proportion to it. Um, but I would say that there are, are very few um, actually low hanging fruit that 
become experiments. I would say that there's a lot of low hanging fruit that just gets directly applied, but that uh, that we sort of decide because of limited resources and all of the reasons that at a startup you you decide to do some things and not do other things. There's just a, a lot of opportunity costs and trade offs that that you're making constantly. Um, some things are just like well. Reducing friction in the onboarding process is going to be better pretty much across the board. So we're going to just do that. We're not going to test uh, outside of some, you know, sort of focus group user testing. We will just design that with the way that, uh, that we think is best and then test the more interesting aspects of it. You know, for example, around goal setting. <laughs> How's that? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's uh, I, I think that's a lesson I definitely, I learned, I think maybe a lot of people learn when you get really pa- inter- interested in testing and maybe like passionate about like running experiments and stuff and even like data-driven decision-making. It's like, well, you actually don't have to test everything. <laughs> there's a lot of things like testing does take time. So like, yes. there's a lot of things that are just kind of no-brainers. Like, like you said, the improving the onboarding flow, just making it easier for people if, if that's just going to result in an objectively better experience for the user, um, we don't really need to take the time to measure that. Just do it, you know, because it's a better decision. Right. So I kind of had, you know, one other question, a little bit shifting gears a little bit. Um, I was talking to somebody a few weeks ago, um, actually previous guest, uh, Matt Waller from uh, uh, Clover Health. Um, oh, wonderful. And he was talking about some health stuff. And, you know, one thing he mentioned was this interesting um, intervention that I think they had run where they looked at a problem that was like, I think it was something like when someone goes to the hospital, there's actually a really high likelihood they'll go back because of whatever happened, you know, so like helping them do better behaviors immediately after that, um, is really cost effective, better for the person. So I think the example he gave was like, if somebody goes to the hospital for something and they need to change their diet, it's much more effective for the healthcare provider, for example, to just send them meals. I don't think this is the exact example. This is along the lines of it. Mm-hmm. But in that example, like somebody needs to change their nutrition. It's much more effective for the healthcare provider to just pay and send them meals for like two weeks, a month afterward or something like that. Because um, even though that's an upfront cost, that will that di- extri- significantly diminishes the likelihood that they will be back in the hospital again, which is ultimately going to cost a lot more. Um, I found that super interesting because I think that's you find that in a lot of areas where people are really hesitant to pay an upfront cost that's a preventive measure, whether it's in health or even in a lot of other areas, even though it's probably a big cost saver down the line. Um, yeah. So I'm just interested to see, like, you know, how much have you seen that in the healthcare space? Because um, it does seem like in general, you know, in like companies I've worked for, I've seen them seem to start investing more in preventive stuff, like bringing flu shots into the office. Like I never got a flu shot for like three or four years, even though I know I'm supposed to until it was literally <laughs> in my office downstairs. And there was like literally no reason for me to not do it. And it was free, you know? Right. Um, so if you kind of see so that. Convenient. Sh- and so convenient. And so convenient. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was curious, like how much you see that no. in the healthcare space and like this, uh, there's more, um, and how much you need to prove those things behaviorally and that it's worth maybe an upfront cost that isn't necessarily intuitive to spend, even though it's in, it's a lot cheaper in the long run. Yeah, so uh, the evidence is sort of mixed on whether it's a lot cheaper in the long run. And and that is uh, at least the large-scale studies that have been uh, done of preventive behaviors. Uh, and so that's really problematic for people like me who believe that this is absolutely the most cost-effective way uh, to go about things. And I think uh, part of it is in the, you know, really uh, boring defining of what do we mean by preventive behaviors. But but in your Clover health example, like that seems like a very uh, specific intervention that here's what happened when we did this thing that, that we also have control over. So it gets very messy when you, uh, when you get into uh, preventive behaviors that the patient or patient user is control in control of. But, but you as a provider don't have any control of. Um, and, and you I do see a lot of this aversion to uh, preventive care, I think, just because it, it is so uncertain and hard to measure and hard to control. And uh, this, uh, this combination of things makes, uh, makes people, they, it's not that they don't think there's any value in preventive care, but they're not willing to 
um, go all in and, you know, put everything into it. So yeah, certainly, uh, (laughs) I think by generating more evidence for uh, the impact, the the ROI of these sorts of interventions, that's how we're going to get ahead. Um, and, and also designing interventions where um, you're not just depending on patients to take all the right actions, but we can do things like, you know, send the meals. Like that seems like very good uh, <laughs> intervention. Yeah, that's certainly difficult to measure and probably takes a long time. Um, so that, maybe yes. those are the kind of things that are a good example we were talking about where it's easier to try those kind of things at a smaller scale in a smaller company um, and yeah. sort of like share those learnings and, you know, implement it more broadly. Absolutely. Okay. So I know we're coming a little later in our time here. Um, Sirak, do you have any other last questions before we go into some of our general concluding ones? Well, I guess go ahead. like the last one that I would say, this is not like an official question. It's more just like, <laughs> are there things that you want to say that we haven't asked you about? Like, you're like, oh man, if only they'd asked about this and we're like, <laughs> we just didn't even know. Man, I feel like this is like the interview question that, you know, like in a job interview that you're like, man, like, how did I not see that coming? <laughs> like, I, now they think I'm a dummy. <laughs> um, no, n- not much. I didn't uh, think so. Like, I felt like we were crushing the whole time. Yeah. So, I, I, I mean, we, we, we are were pretty amazing so interviewers, thorough. so it's rare we miss something. <laughs> yeah, and well prepared. So. <laughs> Well, uh, no, I mean, to feel you covered the thing, I feel like the other thing we should like to uh, ask people at the end is, um, you know, what is that? What advice would you give to someone who is listening and is interested in behavioral science, is learning about it, um, and either wants to grow their kind of practicing of it, whether that's actually making a career out of it or making it a part of their job they currently have? Um, you know, what's your advice for aspiring behavioralists? Hmm. So I think... Um... Probably a a very uh, common piece of advice um, that I've certainly heard before and would agree with is uh, just start running studies yourself. Start applying behavioral science, uh, you know, in all the ways that you can. Get creative. It's a lot of fun. Uh, Prepare to fail in all kinds of ways. Um, But then I think the, the, the advice that I wish that I was given as a behavioral scientist, not trying to get into behavioral science, but trying to understand what else was out there and what the sort of world of applied behavioral science was and uh, like how to navigate that terrain. I tried to like go about this in my own introvert way of just like scouring the internet and collecting information and stalking people online. And that was not a very effective way of understanding what was going on. Um, what I really had to do was reach out to people and uh, who were doing things that I you know, saw were very cool and just ask them to talk to me and give me some advice and just lay all my cards out and tell them, hey, I'm interested in what you're doing. And I think if I had been pushed to do that, I don't know, like five to seven years earlier, like, that would have been really good for me. I really only did that a uh, couple of years ago. And uh, it has been hugely beneficial to like my feeling of acceptance and involvement and uh, just like really feeling like, like a part of this tribe. So reach out to people uh, and uh, you can send a cold email. It's fine. People usually reply. And if they don't, that's their loss. That's yeah. my advice. <laughs> the behavioral community I found is uh, somewhat small, uh, smaller than it may seem. And uh, people are generally uh, very helpful and very open to bring, making it larger. So I think that's good advice. Yeah. Absolutely. All right, everyone, on three, let's all say our phone numbers. <laughs> 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 we need a, we need an open like text message line. <laughs> awesome. Uh, well, in that case, there's nothing else I want to cover. I think we can... Uh, wrap up our conversation here so it's been awesome having you thank you for uh joining us on this uh lovely august evening and i hope you enjoy your vacation coming up on the beach yeah thanks bring a lot of great behavioral reading while you're sitting on the beach i promise you <laughs> <laughs> i am actually a weirdo and read like nonfiction, like video science books like when i'm on vacation so uh that's yeah. i don't know Do what it. that says about me can't quit <laughs> you can't quit can't quit i'm addicted <laughs> 
All right. Well, thanks a ton, and uh, we'll see everybody soon. Thank you for listening. That concludes this edition of Action Design Radio, hosted by Eric Johnson and Zarak Khan. All podcast episodes are available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many other platforms where you might typically get your pod on. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Special thanks to Morgan Bortz for design. And as always, we would like to recognize Steve Wendell, founder of the Action Design Network, a nonprofit organization dedicated to spreading awareness about behavioral economics, psychology, and all things behavioral science in order to help you improve your life, your career, and your understanding of the world around us and the people in it. I am your producer and audio engineer, Zach Simon. For more cutting-edge behavioral science content, visit action-design.org. Once again, that's action-design.org. There, you can sign up for our newsletter and find an in-person event happening near you. We have chapters in over a dozen cities in the United States and Canada. Also, on our website, you can find additional notes and links regarding the topics discussed in today's episode. Thank you again for tuning in, and we will see you again soon.